the southern kingdom began to copy the northern kingdom. Even though in all of that, God proved that he was worthy, they still copied the weaker brother or the weaker sister. So the Bible says this, and it was told the house of David saying, the house of David being the southern kingdom, being Judah. Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved. And the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, go forth to meet Ahaz. Verse 2 is talking about Ahaz as the king over the house of Judah. Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shir Jajusab, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway in the fuller's field. So God says to Isaiah the preacher, he said, I want you to go meet Ahaz and take your son. I want you to talk to him because he's scared. He, he, he realizes uh, the, inter, the intel has come to him. He realizes that the northern kingdom uh, uh, and, and Syria are confederate against him and that they're coming down after him and, and he's in trouble. And we're going to look at Ahaz in just a little bit. And it's an incredible thing that God is willing to send Isaiah to Ahaz once you begin to look at the, the story of the man Ahaz. But God is a merciful God. And God is a good God. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz. In verse number seven, verse 4. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. In other words, shut up and listen. Amen. He said, take heed and be quiet. And then he said, fear not. Neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of the smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and the son of Ramalia. So he, Isaiah's message to Ahaz is, he said, first of all, don't say anything. He said, listen, don't be afraid. He said, for God said, these two tails of this smoking firebrand, this confederacy, this northern alliance is coming down against you, even though human nature tells you to be afraid and all your generals tell you to be afraid and your intuition tells you to be afraid. God said to Isaiah, don't be afraid. Ahaz, don't, and again, when we look at it, you're going to be amazed because Ahaz was not a Sunday school boy. A matter of fact, I'll just jump ahead and tell you that Ahaz had tried to shut down the worship of God. But God in his grace and his mercy still says to Ahaz, look, you don't have to fear them. The reason being, let me just go ahead and tell you, because it's God you fear. And so Isaiah went to Ahaz. He said in verse number five, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand. Listen, nothing happens to us apart from what God allows it to happen. You and I, as God's people, are like the, like the little nation of, of Judah, the, the southern kingdom of Israel, the tribe of Judah. Uh, that We're part of that same tribe, by the way. Uh, we're birthed in through Jesus Christ. And he's saying to them, doesn't matter who allies against you. It doesn't matter what their determined counsel is. It doesn't matter what their intention is. God said, you don't have to fear them. You don't have to worry about it. I'll take care of you. Now understand this today, that there is a determined counsel against us as God's people. There is a very definitive uh, definitive enemy of God's people. There is a crowd that... If they have their way, if they could have their way, they would not allow us to gather here. We would not be gathered here and assembled as a church. The Bible would be outlawed. The Bible would be banned. In some places it is already. And the whole idea of Christianity, the whole idea of a family, the whole idea of what the Bible teaches us is right would be considered wrong, and all that the Bible teaches us is wrong would be considered right. And by the way, the Bible says that that day will come. 
The Bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, it's, it's important not to take a verse like that and become a fatalist and just give up and say, well, what's the use? I'll just quit. And the, the, the thing that we have to fight against so much in, in our nation, and, and, and I, I, lo- I want to be an optimist. Amen? I want to be an optimist. And I, matter of fact, I'm going to be an optimist. I, I always want there to be a flicker of hope that burns on the inside. As so long as I live, if, if the Lord lets me live uh, to be 50 in a couple of years, if the Lord lets me live to be 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 or whatever it is, and if by His grace I can preach along the way, I don't ever want to stand in the pulpit and look out at the people and say, guess what, people? There's no hope. What kind of a preacher comes to the pulpit with the word of God in his hand and says to the people, there's no hope. There's always hope. Amen. And I don't want to say about my nation that there's no hope. And regardless of the outcome of the election in two days, you won't find me up here next week waving the white flag of surrender saying there's no hope. Brother, listen, because the truth of the matter is the hope is in God and the hope is in you and I as God's people. And I just want to show you this afternoon how we get God's help. I want you to know something. God wants to help. He wants to help. God wants to help in our families and He wants to help us as individuals and God wants to help in our church. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might find grace to help in time of need. The Bible said He's a very present help. God wants to help you. It's like the story of the little boy that was out playing Hot Wheels one day and, 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 and as, as he was playing, he came, came across a big old rock that was in the way and he couldn't build the road that he was trying to build. Bentley, you don't have to copy him. He looked up and saw him and then he copied him. <laughs> Listen, you, uh, he's trying. And so he, the little boy tried and tried and tried. He got all of his daddy's tools down. I mean, he beat on the rock. He pried on it. He dug. That's That's... Playing with Hot Wheels, that's when you get down in the dirt and you have a little toy and, and you're actually, you know, you're playing in the dirt and having fun. I used to spend all my days, all my hours playing Hot Wheels. I, I, I ruled the world with Hot Wheels, amen. And that little boy, though, and he came across that rock and it was in the middle of the road. And he couldn't get it out and his daddy come home, had tools everywhere. About every tool that daddy had in the garage was out laying there and his daddy looked at him and he said, son, what have you been doing? He said, daddy, he said, I've been trying to get this rock out of here. He said, your tools ain't no good. He said, they don't work. He said, there ain't no way to get it out. And his daddy said, are you sure there's no way? And that went on for a few minutes. And finally he looked at his daddy. He said, there is no way. There's no hope of getting it out, daddy. I already tried. He said, have you asked your daddy for help? He said, no. Nope. He said, why don't you think about that? He said, oh, daddy, would you help me? And he said, I sure will. And being a good dad, that daddy set his lunchbox down, forgot about how tired he was, forgot about how hungry he was, forgot about uh, how nice it would be to go in and sit down. He set his lunchbox down and he got down there and he and his boy, after a little bit of toil, a little bit of effort together, they got to rock out. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. God wants to help. All throughout the Bible, he he commands us to pray. He said, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And it doesn't matter today what kind of shape America is in and how how much we've departed from God. It matters. But the truth of the matter is, I'm going to tell you, God still wants to help America. Amen. God still wants to help. He still wants to help our churches and he still wants to help you. He wants you to know how great he is. You know, God's never once looked down and waited for me to prove how good I am. I'm not going to get to heaven someday and God says, all right, go ahead, Travis, tell me how great you are. But we think that we think sometimes we get to thinking that God's waiting to figure out how great we are. God knows we're nothing. He made us. He remembers that we are but dust. That we're clay. 
And he says, without me, you can do nothing. So God goes to Ahaz, this scoundrel, this absolute scoundrel, and he goes to him and he says, listen, the two northern kingdoms are confederate against you. You're in trouble, I reckon. And, he's, and, and you didn't have to tell Ahaz that. Ahaz was scared. He knew the odds were impossible. He knew he was in trouble. The Bible says in verse 6, let's go up against Judah, they said, and vex it. Verse number seven, thus saith the Lord, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass, talking about the counsel of the enemies of God's people. For the head of Samaria, Samaria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. God said to the king of Judah, within this period of time, this nation will not even stand. Why did he say that? Because he was trying to convince Ahaz to trust him. And by the way, that's all God wants from us. Is he, God just wants us to trust him. He just wants us to believe that he is who he says he is. The Bible says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's all God wants you to do is believe in him. By the way, that's, that's the spirit of a father also. Just want them, their children to believe in them. The Bible said it, verse number 7, And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of uh, uh, Samaria is Ramalia's son. And then he says, If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Now, I'm not going to keep reading, but in the, in the next part of this chapter right here, it's an incredible thing. Uh, the Lord does say this. He says, ask a sign, Ahaz. And Ahaz says, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to tempt God. Isaiah is commissioned by God. He says, no, go ahead. Ask a sign. Ask something. And Ahaz said, no, nah, I ain't going to do it. And so God says, well, since you ain't going to do it, I'll just go ahead and give you a sign. He said, behold, a virgin shall conceive. So the greatest sign of all, the greatest promise of all is given to Ahaz. Ahaz hears from the lips of Isaiah the promise of the Redeemer of, Israel, of Judah and Israel, uh, of Jesus Christ, and Ahaz still won't listen. He still rejects God. Turn over to chapter number 9 of Isaiah. Look at verse number 8, if you would. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 8. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lighted up on Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in, in the pride and stoutness of the heart, listen to this. Here's what they say. The bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Here's what they were saying. They were saying, yeah, we know things are bad. And they're bad because we disobeyed God. But they said, we're going to make it better, even though God judged us. It's kind of like our nation. We're going to, we're going to make it better. We're going to make it better. We're going to build back, build back. Yeah, that was the, the theme, you know, build back better. We're going to build back better. We're just not going to do it God's way. That's pride. That's arrogance. That's stoutness of heart. That's saying, God, we know that our nation is crumbled. We know that our nation is decaying. But that's okay, God. We'll fix it back better than it was when you did it. And the Bible says this, therefore, the Lord shall set, up, shut up the, shall set up the adversaries of reason against him and join his enemies together. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth for all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And look at verse 13, for the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. The people turn not to him that smites them. But where do they turn? Well, we're going to skip some. You can read the rest of that story if you want to. 
We're just not going to now. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 28. 2 Chronicles chapter 28 is the, is the history of Ahaz. Listen. 2 Chronicles chapter 28. I want to make, give you time to find it just a minute. I, I will not be too much longer. But I want you to see this. Second Chronicles chapter 28 and verse number one. Ahaz, this is Ahaz. I, you need to know this dude. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not, that was his right, in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. Now the, very, the chapter before this is about Jotham, the father of Ahaz. It'd be good, not now, be good to read about Jotham. It's interesting. Jotham did right in the sight of God, but he did, still did some dumb stuff. We're, you're going to do some things wrong. There's only one perfect one, and that's Jesus Christ. But you don't have to be Ahaz. The Bible says about Jotham, at least it says this, uh, in verse 6 of chapter 27, So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his way before his God. Everything about Ahaz's father, Jotham, was not right. But at least he became mighty because he feared God. But when it comes to this man Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the king of Judah, who come down from the lineage of David, it seems like Ahaz just was the absolute definition of a deconstructionist. Which we have a lot of those in our society today. He said, you know what, boys? He said, I'm just going to do it all together different. He said, we're just going to from we're going to start from scratch and we're going to make it all better. My way. Forget about everything David ever did. Forget about everything Josiah ever did. Forget about everything that Ahaz ever did. I think Josiah had been before him. I might be wrong on that. Forget about all of them. He said, we're going we're, we're gonna to tear it all down and build it all back up better. Ahaz was an idiot. And we have some of those around, running around in our world today. In the church and in the world. Politically and spiritually, we have a lot of Ahazes. The Bible says this, that he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. The Bible says, for he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. And made also molten images for Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hin Hinnom. And burnt his children in the fire. By the way, his son was one of the best, greatest kings that Israel had. Isn't that crazy? Again, I don't have time. You've got to study that on your own. But his son, the son of Ahaz, was one of the greatest kings Israel ever had. Or Judah ever had. You, got, you can read the rest of the story if you want to. You got Jotham. You got Ahaz. And then you got his son follows after him. The Bible says this, that he burnt his own children in the fire. He burnt his own children in the fire. He's going to make it better though. We're going to do like Israel. We're going to do like the northern kingdoms do. Remember, they're the ones that come down after him to destroy him. Now listen. Listen. After the abomination of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel, the same people that God had kicked out, now all of a sudden He said, we're going to emulate them. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. That's, that's Ahaz. That after doing all that, God sent Isaiah the prophet to his doorstep to meet him at the end of the conduit to tell him, Ahaz, the enemy is coming. The people that you've been patterning yourself after, the people that you've 
turned away from me to copy after. They are confederate against you and they're coming down to destroy you, but it's not going to work. All you have to do, Ahaz, is repent and believe me. And Ahaz wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He refused to listen to the man of God, Isaiah. But even then, I want you to see what God did. Look at verse number five. Wherefore the Lord, his God, delivered him, him into the hand of king of Syria. It didn't say that Syria defeated him. It says that God delivered him into their hand. You know why? Because Ahaz was bad. But Judah was God's country, God's nation. Judah represented God's people. Jesus would come, humanly speaking, he would come from the tribe of Judah, the same tribe that Ahaz was a part of. The Bible says, and they smote him. The two northern kingdoms, the uh, affiliated nations, Syria and Israel, the northern kingdom, they smote him. And carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel who smote him with a great slaughter. Look at this. For Pekah, the son of Ramalia, slew in Judah and 120,000 in one day. Did you hear that? Don't think about that. 120,000 in Judah, the Bible says this about them, that they were all valiant men. Can you imagine losing 120,000 of your most valiant soldiers? I'm talking about the likes of Jonathan. He would have been like Jonathan, would have been like David. The valiant men, like David's mighty men, in one day, Judah lost 120,000, not bums, not losers, but their very best men fell to the sword in one day because Ahaz would not listen to God. Not because the northern alliance was so great. Not because Syria was so great. Not because Israel was so great. But because Ahaz refused to acknowledge that God was so great. All we, what we must do is acknowledge how great God is. The truth of the matter is, we cannot change the Northern Alliance. We cannot change the hearts of Syria. We cannot change the hearts of, uh, of the Northern tribe of Israel that's turned away from God. That The purpose of Isaiah's message was not to change their hearts. It was simply to get one man, Ahaz, the ruler of the people, to acknowledge God. That's all he had to do. And, that, and he would not do it. Look what the Bible says. So the Bible says that they were all valiant men in verse number six. Notice the last clause in the sentence. Because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. The reason why they lost 120,000 valiant men in one day. The reason why they suffered so great a slaughter is not because they went up against so great an army, but because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. Verse 7 says, And Zichri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Messiah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the governor of the house, and Elkanah that was next to the king. So the king lost his Son, the king lost his chief men because of his stubbornness. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters. 200,000, 120,000 murdered, 200,000 carried away in one battle one day. And took also much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. Are you still with me? Look at the next verse. But a prophet of the Lord was there. Where? In the northern kingdom. As wicked as the northern kingdom was, God still had some crazy, 
lunatic, out of their mind, nutso preachers. Can you imagine? I mean, it would have been one thing to have been a preacher in the southern kingdom. You could have got together a few people. There was a few people in the southern kingdom that would have come out to hear you preach. But up there in the northern kingdom, man, a lie. That's like saying, hey, we're going to have a revival, you know, up in Provincetown, you know. I mean, we're going to go, we're going to, go to Boston to have a big, mighty revival. I mean, uh, that's almost impossible. I mean, it's almost unthinkable, almost unheard of. You know, you, we can have a big revival down south. But listen, here's, here's a preacher, a prophet of God that's still running around up north in Israel. I shouldn't use that analogy that much. Forget that part. But this, this prophet is up there, the Bible says. His name was Oded. Now, we all have heard of Isaiah, haven't we? You know why? Because like Isaiah got to preach to the good guys. O, o, Oded was up there with the dead punch. Oded, preacher to the dead. Amen. I mean, he was up there. Uh, he was up there with the reprobates. He was up there with the people that, had, had, I mean, would just soon spit on him. But it didn't change him. Amen. God's, God needs some people to preach where it's not popular to preach. And so Oded is up there, and he went out before the host that came to Samaria. Look at this. Don't miss this. This, this, this a confederate nation, Syria and northern Israel, they just came back from a battle in Judah where they killed 120,000 valiant men in one day. They gathered together 200,000 hostages. They've got all this possession, and God sends one man, Oded, out. Stop. Stop. I don't know. I mean, I know everybody loves Isaiah, but when I get to heaven, I don't know, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be a little nervous to shake Oded's hand. <laughs> you're talking about it. You're talking about... I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm talking about a valiant man. Can you imagine... I mean, I know Paul, I know what we read about Paul, and I know what we read about John the Baptist, but here's one man, he didn't have a church, maybe five or six people, maybe, maybe a few more. He didn't have any, 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 anybody standing with him. He goes out because God sent him out, and he stands before these two nations that have just destroyed Judah, and he brings God's message to them. He said unto them, Behold, that means look up here. He said, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah. He said, I'm going to tell you why you won today, boys. Not because you're great military. Not because you're great soldiers. Not because you had a great plan. He said, there's one reason and one reason alone why you marched down to Judah and defeated Judah and defeated Ahaz and brought him back captive. And there's one reason why you won the battle. And it's not because of who you are. It's because Ahaz and Judah turned away from God. He took all their thunder away from them. Listen, if God be for us, who then can be against us? Amen. The number one responsibility, the number one duty of God's people is to be right with God. And the, the greatest hope that America has is for us as God's people to be what God would have us to be. The greatest hope, and I don't know who it is, I, I don't know uh, what crowd it is, I don't think it's an individual, but as collectively, you and I as God's people, to him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him and his sin, the greatest thing that can happen in our nation, and the greatest hope, and really the only hope for our nation, is that you and I as God's people would look to God and say, God, help us. All throughout the Bible, we see stories where God saved a nation, where God blessed a nation, not because of the majority, but because of a minority of people that knew God and trusted him. 
You see, this is not a very popular message. I don't know what a popular message is. I'm not trying to be popular, but I do love my nation, and I do love you, and I do love the idea of freedom, and I do love the idea of our nation continuing on. I don't really like the idea, and I don't understand anybody that would promote the idea, but I don't really like the idea of having to learn Chinese to get along, or have the North Koreans come in, or have anybody else come in. I kind of like and I wouldn't mind if until the day Jesus come we could fly the old red white and blue and if our children could grow up and enjoy the freedoms that we've enjoyed and enjoy the nation that we've enjoyed I really don't like the idea of communism Amen. but I do like freedom and I do like liberty and I know who the author of it is and I'm glad for our military and I'm glad for our government but I'm not dumb enough to think that that's the reason why we're free and that's not why we'll stay free the reason why we'll stay free is blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the hope of our nation is for God's people to look to God and say, God, help us. We believe in you. Amen. We believe in you, God. We know you're God. Well, we, it's not some other God. It's not some Hindu God. It's not our intellect. It's not our might. It's not our ability. But God, it's all you. It's you, God. You see, we're too quick to put our hope in men or in institutions. But our hope is in God. Listen, look at the story. But a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand, and ye have slain them in a rage that reacheth up into heaven. You see, God's concerned about his people. He cares about his people. And Oded said to the people, he said, you won the battle today because God let you. He said, but God's angry. Look at the next part of the story. And now ye purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. But are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? He said, look here. He said, you, I know what y'all decided. He said, you, he said, you think that you're going to keep God's people under your control, under your hand? He said, buddy, Oded said, them are God's people. Can you see Oded walking up to the leader of that thing and putting his finger in his chest and saying, hey, them are God's people you got back there. You imagine them people looking at Odad say, and somebody, you know, I don't think anybody said it out loud, but I'm, I'm sure there was some idiot in the crowd that said, who does this guy think he is? I'll tell you who he was. He was God's man. Amen. And he was not afraid. He, if he was afraid, he wasn't showing it. Amen. Because if you, you, you don't walk in front of a, of a confederacy, a confederate army, it's coming back from a battle raging on the inside, celebrating their victory. And all of a sudden you're one man alone and you walk in front of them and say, let me tell you what God said about all this. Amen. The Bible says, and now you purpose in the verse number 11, he said, now hear me, therefore. Deliver the captives again. God's people. He said, Fret, you can't keep them. They're not yours. You know, it's a mighty big deal t today to remember that you and I belong to God. Amen. I, 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 again, I don't want to reiterate it, but I don't want any of them foreign governments. I don't want any of that stuff. I, like, I love what God's given us. and God has given us a wonderful nation. But there are Christians in China, and God watches over them also. There are Christians in North Korea. There are Christians in the Middle Eastern nations that reject God and despise God. And, and listen, don't ever take it for granted. We get together together and worship God. And by and large, our government stays hands off. But there are nations over there. And there are people there that are sworn enemies of God's people. But guess what? God still watches over his people. 
Think about that. I know that ought to be, that ought to do something on the inside to, 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 that we ought to remember that come what may and, and no matter what might ever happen and God forbid wickedness and our nation turn to some of that kind of stuff and those people that right now they're kind of silent but yet every once in a while they, they voice their opinions against God's people but I'm not talking about opinions against God's people. I'm talking about a nation fully set to destroy God's people, but God still says, guess what, you can't, because they're my people. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Don't ever forget that. Whatever come, come what may. And I don't want anything. I don't want it to come to that state. And I'm not saying that it is. But I'm just saying that God is our stay. God is our confidence. And if we have to be like Oded and stand all alone, we don't have to be afraid. Honestly, we can just trust in God. If it comes to that. We can still trust Him. Look what he says. You purpose to keep the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you, but are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? Now hear me, therefore, and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. He's preaching this to the wickedest bunch of people you could ever preach to. But would you believe it worked? Look what the next verse says. Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Berechiah the son of Meshimoth, Meshimoth, and Jezkiah the son of Shalem, and Amasa the son of Haldali, stood up against them that came from the war. And said unto them, You shall not bring in the captives hither, for whereas ye have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass, for our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. The armed men just walked off. Think about that. They could have killed them. They'd already killed some. Here's 200,000 women, children, had no, no soldiers, no self-defense, and their captors just walked away because God said to. Amen. 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 That's, uh, look, that's pretty powerful. I mean, I, I, you say, well, you think that's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Look what the Bible says. Verse 15, And the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives, and with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them. And arrayed them and shod them and gave them to eat and to drink. They just were captives a few minutes ago, going off to become slaves. And now they're treating them like royalty. Amen. Why? Because Oded, representing God, said, you better watch out. You're in trouble with God. And anointed them and carried all the feeble of them up on asses. They, they, they got off of their donkeys and put the sick and the feeble on theirs and said, here, you ride on my ass. Isn't that something? The Bible says, And brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren, and they returned to Samaria. They just turned around, walked back to Jericho, and said, Here. And then they walked back home. Because God said so. At that time, now look at verse 16. You won't believe this, what I'm going to read to you. You have to see it with your own eyes. At that time, after, after God did that, did, the king, did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him? Why? How hard hearted do you have to be? How hard-headed do you have to be 
Verse number 17 says, For again the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah and taken Beth Shemesh and Agilon and Gitteroth and Shaco, the villages thereof, and Timnah, and with the villages thereof, Gimzo also, and the villages thereof, and they that dwelt there. For the Lord brought low Judah, brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. That's all I'm going to read. You can read the rest of it. Ahaz never repented. He had a son under whom God made a great revival. I have to think that that boy looked at his dad and said, what in the world is wrong with him? And I have to think that that boy heard some preaching that helped him. And you read the, you read the rest of that. It doesn't end with Ahaz. It, it, it continues. And you'll see the, the nation was doomed. But God still brought a great revival from the ashes of ruin that Ahaz had created in, in Judah. One of the great stories in the Bible. I want you to know this afternoon... That our help, our hope is in God. Amen. 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 Come what may, and I've already told you, I, I'm, I'm a human. I, I, want, I, want it, I want to be optimistic. I don't take freedom lightly. I want my children to grow up and know the nation that I've known and yours. I want them to know freedom. I don't teach my children to hate their nation. I want them to love their nation. I'm not a deconstructionist. And I don't like them, by the way. But I want them to know that the God who birthed this nation is the God who, the, who preserves this nation. And the only hope and the only help for America is God. The only hope for you and I, the only help for us is God. I showed you one place where this principle rings so vividly clear. But it's all throughout the Bible. So young, from the youngest here to the teenagers to young people, middle aged, old, whatever. Every one of us need to be reminded that there's a God in heaven saying, ask of me. I'll show you a sign. I'll show you how great I am. Can I can I tell you, don't quit praying. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't write our nation off. But go to God and say, God, we do need you. I need you. And our nation needs you. Don't be like so many and say, well... The election results are in. It went the way I was hoping it would go. I guess it'll all be good now. Hey, don't, I'm, not, I'm not asking you what's your opinion or how, what you think is going to make it right. But all throughout my lifetime, I've seen it with God's people especially, that when it goes the way God's people think it should go, that we somehow or another relax and think it's going to get better. But in all the years of my lifetime, I've not seen it get better. I've seen it get further and further and further. And the only hope for America, our nation, is for a generation to come along and say, God help us. God help us. And God is willing to help. He wants to help. He will help. I believe that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us be here. Dear God, thank you for giving us this testimony in the scriptures. On one hand, dear God, it scares the fire out of me. But God, on the other hand, it gives me hope and confidence. Lord, I want to I go home and read about 
the son of Ahaz. God, because it bothers me, I, and I, to end the story this way. But God, I pray for our nation that this would not be the final chapter of our nation. God, I pray that we would desire revival from you and help. Help us, we pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand? If you need to come, you come. If you would take a moment and pray, whether here at the altar, in your seat, or whatever, just talk to God for a minute. One, one prayer and invitation is not going to fix it, but I'm just saying, let's start somewhere. Amen. If you need to come, if you want to come and pray, you come.